black Americans to vote. He was going to get up on national television in front of Congress for the whole United States to see on national television and emphasize the importance that all people have the right to register and vote, including blacks. And during his address, he ends it with the words, we shall overcome. He ends his address to Congress on March 15, 1965, with the words, We shall overcome. Now this was kind of historic, because these were the words always used by Dr. King when he would finish his speech on the Civil Rights Movement. He always ended his speeches most often with, We shall overcome. And now the President of the United States used it in one of his more famous speeches he would ever give. Now, according to King advisor C.T. Vivian, after listening to Johnson's speech, Dr. King remained silent, but a tear formed, slowly running down his cheek. He was so taken back by the fact that Lyndon Johnson would say those words, we shall overcome. So according to King advisor C.T. Vivian, after listening to Johnson's speech, Dr. King remained silent, but a tear formed running down his cheek. Well, after Johnson's speech and feeling he had the support of the federal government, what did he decide to do? Make that march from Selma to Montgomery. So they waited patiently until the injunction cleared or was disallowed, and they planned the march after all. So after President Johnson's speech, Dr. Clean for Dr. King proclaimed they would overcome and make it from Selma to Montgomery. And after two weeks, the judge's order was lifted. And again, Dr. King is planning the march, historic march from Selma to Montgomery. What do you think Johnson did when he heard about the march? He's going to take some preventative action this time. What's he going to do? He, well, he's going to call in the Alabama National Guard. He's going to call in federal marshals, he's going to call in the FBI, and he's going to assure that they have a non-violent opportunity to march from Selma to Montgomery. So after Johnson hears of King's plans, he calls in units of the Alabama National Guard, he calls in federal marshals and the FBI into service in Alabama. And as a result of that, on March 21st of 1965, the Great March from Selma to Montgomery began again, this time with nearly 3,000 marchers. 3,000 marchers. So again, on March 21st of 1965, the Great March from Selma to Montgomery began again with nearly 3,000 marchers. This time they would be under the protection of the Alabama National Guard, Federal Marshals, and the FBI. After five days of marching, they arrived at the state capitol steps in Montgomery, and there was a crowd of 25,000 people waiting in support of that march. 25,000 people waiting for them at the steps of the capitol. So after five days of marching, they arrived at the steps of the state capitol to a crowd of nearly 25,000 people. Now what does King do when he reaches there? He gives a speech at the steps of the Capitol, and he says, Our feet are tired, but our souls are restful. That was his comment in that speech. Our feet are tired, but our souls are rested. They walked 54 miles from Selma to Montgomery and met a crowd of 25,000 people at the steps of the state Capitol. Well, his, what was his whole purpose of doing this? was trying to get President Johnson to do what? Pass legislation that would give every opportunity to everybody to register a vote. And he finally did that when Congress passed, shortly afterwards, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So shortly after this march, from Selma to Montgomery, after all they went through, Congress eventually passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Interesting story, really. They put a movie together, Selma, they're not being prejudiced, but an African-American lady directed it.
And you know how much credit she gave to Lyndon Johnson for any of it? Zero. Which was really disappointing. When she was confronted about that, she said she didn't write that, didn't, didn't uh, produce that movie for Lyndon Johnson. She produced the movie for African American people, which was a little controversial. Because Johnson had a lot to do. I haven't even watched it under protest. Maybe I did sometime. I don't know. Okay, the third instance that he had to deal with was pretty ugly, and it was called the Watts Riot. Anybody ever heard of the Watts Riot? The Watts Riot. And it occurred on August 11th of 1965. Anybody know what Watts is? Anybody have a clue where it's at? What it is? Okay, you're, getting, you're too young. It's a ghetto in Los Angeles, California. And on August 11th, 1965, violence occurred in the black community of Watts, which I said was a black ghetto in Los Angeles. So on August 11th of, of 1965, violence occurs in the black community of Watts, which was a black ghetto in Los Angeles. Pretty simple story that snowballed into a hell of a mess. Because during the evening hours of August 11, 1965, a Negro man was simply arrested for drunken driving. A Negro man was simply arrested for drunken driving. And as he was being arrested, what happened? A crowd drew around him, all of them black, and all of them very distrustful of the police. Okay? So, on August 11, 1965, in the black ghetto, of Watts outside Los Angeles, a Negro man is arrested for drunken driving and a crowd draws all very distrustful of the police. Well, pretty soon some Negro youths started throwing rocks, which led to empty bottles, which led to about anything they could get their hands on to throw, which led to more than just youths throwing things, everybody got involved. So they drew just distrustful of the police, some Negro youths started throwing rocks, ended up being bottles and then pretty soon became anything they could get their hands on loose they could throw. And this thing that we have as a simple drunken driving arrest leads to five days of riots and disorder in South Central Los Angeles. Five days of riots and disorder in Southern South Central Los Angeles. President Johnson had to call in 13,000 members of the National Guard to get the situation under control in Watts. 13,000 National Guardsmen were brought in to get things under control. And by the time the riot was subdued, major damage had occurred to two things. By the time the National Guard got this under control, major damage occurred to two things. What's one thing major damage occurred to? Where they have major damage? In Watts. Yeah. The other was to President Johnson's great society. Okay? So the damage was done when the riots were subdued. You had two different types of damage. You had physical damage to South Central Los Angeles and the black community of Watts, and you also had severe damage to President Johnson's great society politically. I'll give you some examples of the violence and damage to the people of Watts, okay? So after these five days ended, 34 people were killed. 34 people, that's nothing to snivel about. 34 lives lost in the Watts riot. Approximately 900 people were hurt or injured. Approximately 900 people were hurt or injured. Over 4,000 arrests, over 4,000 arrests in Watts during those five days. 209 buildings were completely gutted by fire. 209 buildings. How many buildings do we have in downtown Warland? 50 max, if that. 209 buildings totally gutted by fire. 780, 787 other buildings in Watts damaged, severely damaged. 787 other buildings in Watts severely damaged. 
What about a store that might have survived gutting or damage? What happened? What? What do you think? What is it? What happened to those stores they weren't even touched? Phys physically. Raw. Raw. Looted. It didn't have a thing left in them. Stores were just absolutely cleaned out. Stripped by looters. So if you were lucky enough, they probably only broke into your front window and stole every TV in there, whatever they were selling. Okay? And they estimated the property loss at $46 million in 1965, which would be, I hate to guess, I'll have to look it up. $46 million in 1965 dollars was the property loss. Now, the reason, that was the physical damage. When I talk about the damage to President Johnson's great society, it created a tremendous backlash among white people who already thought blacks were getting more than they had coming to them. So people began to question Lyndon Johnson's great society. Here you go, feeling sorry for all these poor people, these unfortunate souls, going to give them every opportunity to give everybody else, and look what they've done here. Look what they've done. They rioted, they pillaged, they looted, they destroyed their own community. So the violence and mayhem at Watts really hurt President uh, Johnson's Great Society program. It created a tremendous amount of backlash among many whites who already believed blacks were receiving way more from the government than they should already. Really a sad story. Now, this is after the Watts riot. I'm going to give you a little precursor here to something later. After the Watts riot, black people began taking a more radical philosophy on the way they were being treated. Martin Luther King was nonviolent, very non-radical, peaceful demonstrations. Get the hell beat out of you and like it, but hold your head high for the cause. Well, after the Watts riot, we started to have more radical black leaders. Perfect example was Malcolm X, one of the first radical black leaders in America. And young black radicals like Malcolm X started a new civil rights movement in America, completely opposite of Martin Luther King's philosophy of nonviolent demonstration. They developed what we know as black power, a very radical alternative to the civil rights movement. So the violence and riots at Watts simply drew attention to more radical black leaders such as Malcolm X and initiated a new civil rights movement in America known as black power. Okay, we'll get a start on our next one, and then we'll finish up tomorrow. And that's number four, Chicago, July of 1966. How's Johnson doing so far? Not very good. Everything he's happened is negative. So number four is Chicago, which happened in July of 1966. Now, what's unusual about civil rights in Chicago? When I say Chicago, did that throw anything on you? It's in the north. It's in the north. Absolutely. Nobody ever thought we'd have civil rights issues in the, no in the North. Everything was in the South. But you know what? There's poor black people in the North, too. And Martin Luther King finally decided that he was going to carry his message to the North, the urban areas of the North. So after the march from Selma, Dr. King began to focus his civil rights movement to urban areas in the North, because there are poor black people in the North also. But this would be the first time we moved to the north. And it was at this time that King said to himself, you know what, I can't, my, my dream, my ha I have a dream, can't be fulfilled unless I battle poverty all across the United States, not just in the south. But I've got to pay attention to people that are suffering in the north. And to prove his commitment, he moved his family into a very run-down apartment in a Chicago slum area to try to focus his efforts on helping the poverty-stricken people of the North. So to prove his commitment to battling poverty all across the United States, not just in the South, King moves his fa entire family into a rundown apartment in a Chicago slum area. Now, just so you know a little bit of a black history lesson here. In the Chicago slum areas in 1966, 
black people were committed to live by their own creed, which was called love thy neighbor. That might not mean what you think it does. Okay? So all the people who lived in the slum areas of Chicago had their own creed, and their creed was love thy neighbor. Now, I can't explain it. I can because of the history part. But love thy neighbor was first explained to the media by a Reverend Walter Fautroy. And Walter Fautroy was a member of the SCLC. And he explained the philosophy of love thy neighbor in the slums of Chicago. Now, and I will talk about this and see if you thought it's what you thought about it. Love thy neighbor. Okay, so the Reverend Walter Fautroy, who was a member of Martin Luther King's SCLC, explained the philosophy of love thy neighbor in the slums of Chicago as follows. Now, I want you just to listen to this and not worry about writing it down. You can get it off tape or whatever. Now, the thing about this was, this was interesting is Reverend Fautry explained that the people living in Chicago slums loved thy neighbor in self-defense. They loved their neighbor in self-defense. What does that mean? He says this, I want my neighbor to have some income. Otherwise, he might be coming for my income. So he's loving his neighbor in self-defense. I hope that Maddie has all kinds of money. Because if Maddie doesn't have any money, she's going to come and try to steal any money I have. So you're loving your neighbor, wishing your neighbor good in self-defense. I hope she has all kinds of money. Because then I won't have to worry about her coming and trying to take mine from me. Okay. Another example he gave you says, I want my neighbor to have justice. Otherwise, guess who's going to face the weight of his anger? Okay, if I feel, if we're kind of stuck here together 24-7, and somebody cheats me from the outside, who am I going to take that out on? All of the neighborhood, right? And that's what he's saying. Okay, he wishes his neighbor to have justice. I hope Caitlin has justice, because if she doesn't have justice and feels cheated, Who's going to have to feel the brunt of her anger? Me. Because this is where we're at. This is where we live. So you're wishing your neighbor great justice and self-defense because if they don't get good justice, they're going to take it out on you. And another quote he said I thought was interesting. He says, anger leads to violence and violence drives people mad. And what he, what he meant by mad was crazy. Okay. Anger leads to violence, and violence drives people mad. So his point in Love Thy Neighbor is, you wish your neighbor the best so they don't make your life miserable by not having what they need. That's loving your neighbor in self-defense. I hope Brady keeps that truck and somebody doesn't steal it from him, because if somebody steals that truck from him, he's going to come and steal mine. Okay? That's what they're meaning. Well, somebody burned a Ku Klux Klan flag in Brady's lawn. He gets no justice. So what's he going to do? He's going to rage out against that and cause one to be burnt in my lawn. That's what they're talking about. And he's basically saying that anger leads to violence and violence drives people mad or crazy. Well, in Chicago, back to the point, in Chicago, Martin Luther King Jr. is going to launch a campaign to address these three following issues in that poverty-stricken slum area of Chicago. These are the three things he wants changed. These are the issues he's going to address. So when he's in Chicago, moved his family into the slum area, he's going to launch a civil rights campaign, and he wants these three things addressed in that poverty-stricken slum area. What do you think he might want addressed? What do you think, Sage? What, what's going on in Chicago that he doesn't like? What does that do with voting? Just tell you that. What, what disadvantages are people in the slum area of Chicago? What disadvantages they have over people that don't live there? Jobs. What, what's that? Jobs. Absolutely, employment. So that's going to be one of his issues. Is the high unemployment rate among those people living in the Chicago slums. What else might he be upset about, Tristan? That he wants change besides employment opportunities? Uh, better housing? Awesome. Unfair housing practices. He feels like there's some unfair housing practices going on. And what are we doing in here today, whether you want to be in here or not today? You are learning. And you think, oh, this is, I don't want to learn today. Well, I'll tell you what, 
Those people, those children in the slum areas of Chicago were dying for an opportunity to learn anything. And so the third point that he wanted changed was poor education in the slums. So in Chicago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. launches a campaign to address unfair housing practices, unemployment issues, and poor educational opportunities for those children living in those, those areas. So we'll finish with this. So what does he do in late July of 1966? What's the point of this example? He's going to organize what in Chicago to protest these three things? Another march. So in July of 1966, Dr. King is going to organize a series of marches in Chicago. And you know where they're going to go through? Doesn't do any good to protest through the slums. Who the hell is going to listen to you there? All white neighborhoods. He is going to march through all white neighborhoods to protest the poor education, the poor employment, and the unfair housing practices in Chicago. Can you think of a worse place to go? But you're obviously not going to march through the slums, are you? Those people are going to do anything for you? Well, we'll find out tomorrow how his march works out for him as he walks through all white neighborhoods protesting those three things in the slums of Chicago. How do you think it's going to work out? Not well. Those people who live in those all white neighborhoods, I bet they're going to be excited to see him.